Awesome. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Very excited to be here to be able to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, and that's artificial intelligence and its applications in dentistry. Uh, big thank you to Catapult Education for hosting us and, and Tanya Dunlap from Perio Protect. I'm excited to be able to do this presentation with her, and we'll, we'll hear from her towards the uh, later half of the program. Uh, my name is Dr. Colt, and I am the clinical director with Overjet. And Overjet is the largest uh, provider of artificial intelligence services for the dental industry. Um, just, just a little bit about myself, and I only do this just so you know kind of what, where my perspective is coming from. Uh, I am a general dentist. Um, I am a former DSO executive having joined uh, Overjet. Uh, previously, I was the uh, chief operating officer of a DSO in central Pennsylvania. And prior to that, I had started and, and sold a, another small DSO before that. So the reason I tell you that is because I feel and have felt a lot of the pain points that a lot of you are experiencing in your dental practices. Um, both, and I know we have a wide variety of attendees. I know we've got some uh, general dentists, hygienists, uh, periodontists, and uh, administrative staff. I know we've got the, a lot of the whole crew here. So I'm excited to be able to show and talk to you about how artificial intelligence is going to help really make an impact for improving the quality of patient care, um, improving the quality of your experience as a clinician and as staff in a dental office, and, and really just Im Im improve overall the quality of dentistry that we're able to deliver. Um, now, just by way of a quick disclaimer, uh, since I'm the clinical director of Overjet, a lot of the pictures and experiences that I'm going to present to you today are from our Overjet platform. Um, Overjet is an FDA regulated product, and we have two separate FDA clearances, one for our bone level measurements um, and another one for our caries detection, that's specifically on bite wing x-rays. Now, I'm going to talk a lot more than just those two things, so I'm going to kind of pull the curtain behind and talk to you about uh, where artificial intelligence is, some fun and uh, interesting things that we're working on and where it's going to be. And, and so you're going to hear a little bit of the FDA regulated product, and then you're also going to hear uh, some more experimental or future applications of artificial intelligence in dentistry. So there's going to be a, a nice mix throughout this, part, throughout this uh, presentation. Um, if you do have any questions as we're going, uh, the chat is open, is open, excuse me. I can't actually see it, but uh, Tanya has graciously agreed to uh, moderate the chat. So feel free to type in questions anytime. I'm happy to take those during the presentation. Uh, certainly don't have to wait till the end. Um, but what I want to start with is uh, presenting a couple of x-rays, and I want to ask you a couple of questions. Now, I recognize this is not an interactive format, so um, you know, if I was standing in front of you in an auditorium and asking these questions, I'd try to get some hands. I, I don't expect that here for the webinar, but I want you to think of the answers in your mind. When you look at this x-ray, is there caries on this x-ray? Now, for a lot of you, the answer is fairly obvious, right? But as you're thinking about that, I want you to think about where is the caries? How large is the caries? Does the caries require treatment? And there may be multiple answers for these. Uh, and then the next question is, is there bone loss on this x-ray? And if your answer to that is yes, how, how do you know that there's bone loss? What is the frame of reference that you're using to determine that? And then the next question would be, how much bone loss is there on this x-ray? Um, and what we're going to do as we go through the, the, uh, the webinar tonight is we're going to help be able to quantify some of these questions. Now, in this particular x-ray, some of these answers are fairly obvious, right? It, there's massive calculus, uh, there's large caries. But what if we do an example that's maybe not quite as obvious? So same questions on this x-ray. Is there caries on this x-ray? Is there bone loss on this x-ray? And if so, how do you know? And how much bone loss is there? And do we have enough information to answer all those questions? Um, and again, we'll come back and uh, be able to help answer these a little bit as, as we go. Now, I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, why artificial intelligence is needed in dentistry. And, and to do that, I wanna start with, with a story and it's gonna sound like a pretty generic story. Um, so this is uh, the story of a young lady who had been going to the dentist for some time and who had had your typical restorative treatment plan. So a couple of restorations here or there, you know, one or two every year or two, nothing major. Uh, then due to some life changes, uh, there's a change of uh, insurance. Uh, she wanted to stay in network, so she transferred, transitioned to a new dental office, went and saw that dentist, and uh, from six months prior, not having received any, any diagnosis for any cavities, going to having eight cavities diagnosed that required treatment. Um, 
and, and I want you to think about that experience. And many of you have probably heard this same story, whether about yourself or your family or friends, or probably even patients in your dental practice who have come to you or left your practice. Um, now, this particular story is a true story. And this, th this uh, story is about this young lady named Warda Inam. And she happened to be a PhD uh, in engineering from MIT. And this uh, was problematic for her. And she couldn't understand why there was a difference in treatment plans from these two providers. Why, why was the criteria different? Now, with her having the experience that she did, she would go on to found Overjet, which, as I mentioned, is the largest provider of artificial intelligence uh, in the dental industry. Now, most of our patients are not PhDs from MIT. They're not going to go out and create their own unique uh, solutions for the problems that they're having. So how can we as clinical providers help increase their confidence in us? And, and then if we look at the situation, and again, it sounds generic, but this is real. and This is happening every day across the country in many dental practices. What, what was the concern uh, in, in the story from the provider's point of view, right? So the, from the provider, if you're one of those dentists, whether the first dentist or the second dentist, and you heard that your patient left and had this other experience, what, well, how would you describe that, that issue? Well, we call that standardization, or in this case, it's a lack of standardization. So standardization really describes using uniform criteria to make your diagnosis, uh, and specifically we're talking about dentistry, of course. Um, now, in dentistry, it's never realistic to think that you're going to get providers to agree 100% of the time. But can we at least unify and standardize some of the processes to, to make that experience uh, more appropriate for patients? And then if we look at this from the patient's point of view, how would the patient describe that? The patient doesn't care about standardization. They don't, they don't know what that means, nor should they. From the patient standpoint, they're looking at this as, as a lack of trust. So they, they, they don't trust that the new provider, the new dentist, had their best interest. They don't trust that the new dentist was diagnosing accurately. And then from that experience, they actually lose trust in their prior dentist who maybe they didn't have any trust issues with, but now they're wondering, did my last dentist, was, was he diagnosing appropriately? So, so these two uh, issues, standardization and trust are gonna play hand in hand. And, and we're gonna talk about this a fair bit, a little bit later in the webinar and, and how artificial intelligence can help impact these areas. So before we get into that, though, since we're talking artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence is really so new to the dental industry. I mean, we're really we're talking about the last 18 months that that AI has been commercialized and available for dental practices. I, I think it's important to talk a little bit about some of the limitations that come from AI, um, you know, both what AI can do and what AI is not able to do. Um, but then I think to give you a little bit of an experience and exposure to really how the AI was trained and developed and what its current capabilities are. And then I want to come back and, and really demonstrate how it can help with standardization, uh, increasing patient, patient trust. We'll talk about some diagnosing. And then uh, if there's some time, we'll go through some case studies here. So artificial intelligence uh, in its current forms in dentistry is, is essentially on two-dimensional radiography. So we're looking at bite wings, panoramic x-rays, and periapical films. Um, and of course, there is a lot of work being done to expand that to three-dimensional and, and other uh, venues. But in its current form, artificial intelligence is able to detect suspected pathology on radiographs. And that word suspected is really important because um, as you'll see, as we get to the limitations, Overjet does not diagnose anything and artificial intelligence does not diagnose anything. Artificial intelligence is a findings tool to assist clinicians, doctors and hygienists and other staff to analyze radiographs in a more systematic format. And it can increase the provider's diagnostic confidence, their accuracy, and ultimately, as we'll show uh, as we go through this, help increase patient case acceptance. And so what the AI cannot do is it does not perform a dental exam for you. And that's because artificial intelligence cannot diagnose. It, it is not called overjet DDS or DMD. Uh, artificial intelligence is, is a platform, it's a resource. You know, it, it's another arrow in your quiver, so to speak. Um, it also does not treatment plan, uh, which ultimately leads to, to this, this next point is that artificial intelligence is not a replacement for a quality clinician. Um, artificial intelligence is an adjunct to aid clinicians, but certainly not a replacement for a good clinician. And, and then this last one, and I actually get this question quite a bit, uh, artificial intelligence does not replace the need for good quality x-rays. And if anything, artificial intelligence demonstrates the need for quality x-rays rather than replaces them. So overlap context, still problematic. If you don't get the apex when you're taking periapical, artificial intelligence isn't gonna, excuse me, isn't gonna make up for that. So artificial intelligence has been around for a long time, not, not necessarily in dentistry, but in medicine, it's been around for about a decade or so. And 
all of us interact with artificial intelligence routinely in our day-to-day -day lives. So your iPhone using facial recognition, uh, Tesla's, Netflix, uh, Google search recommendations, all of these use some element of artificial intelligence. Now, in medicine, it's really fascinating. They actually use artificial intelligence in a similar fashion that we're applying it in dentistry. And what you're seeing here on the slide in front of you is being able to use AI to help aid pathologists to detect breast cancer on imaging slides. And so we can take the whole image slide, they, they crop it into numerous overlapping sections, and then they can run that through the AI, and it will highlight areas that it recognizes are highly suspicious of, of tumor cells. And so it's not replacing a pathologist, but it's aiding the pathologist, making the pathologist inspection quicker and helping them be more accurate in their diagnosis, which is the same way that we're, we're applying it here in the dental uh, industry. Now, to, to really understand artificial intelligence, I do want to take maybe a half step back and just do like an AI 101 here just for a couple of minutes. So uh, artificial intelligence at its core is simply a broad term. It really just describes any computer system uh, that or, or program that can replace a task that typically would re require some level of human intelligence. Okay, so if we're able to replace some human intelligence, such as uh, being able to recognize carries on a radiograph, um, that would be artificial intelligence applied in that situation. Now, there's a couple other terms that you're going to hear frequently as we talk about AI, and one of those is machine learning. So that that's a, a, a couple of words that are a subset of artificial intelligence, but they really describe the way in which artificial intelligence programs are trained. So, and machine learning itself is, is, a, is a broader uh, term for, for other models of, of learning, such as deep learning. So at, at its core, machine learning is really the, describes the ability for uh, algorithms and statistical models, excuse me, to really help draw inferences from patterns and data. So for in a, in a radiograph, for example, it's recognizing patterns that it's been trained on uh, using computer vision and looking looking at the radiographs. And then deep learning describes a higher level of learning that that really more replicates how the human brain works. And, and I'll, I'll kind of dive into that here just a little bit deeper. So I, I want to give you an example of machine learning and, and how a model is developed. A very simple example, because I think it'll help give you an appreciation for how models within dentistry are trained and the complexity that, that is involved with that. So here's a very simple example. Um, uh, one that a uh, good machine learning scientist could probably whip up in a matter of, you know, uh, 30 minutes or something, um, how to recognize a square. Okay. So the reason this is simple is because with this particular problem that we're having is we want to be able to recognize in an image if the square is present. Now with a, with a square, we can manually define all the features of a square. So this would be like what you're taught as you're going through elementary school when you're uh, used to determine if something's a square versus a rectangle versus a circle, right? So we could teach the model to recognize if there's a closed shape that has four equal sides and four angles that are 90 degrees, you know, et cetera. And if it detects all of those things and it could say, yes, this is a square. And then you can create the model. And then just by being able to define all the features, we could then feed it a whole data set of images and it could go through and apply those manually defined features and algorithms to those images to give us our output. Now, that's a very simple example, right? But what if our example was a little bit more complicated? What, what if we weren't trying to identify if there's a square on the screen? What if we were trying to recognize if something like this was in an image? So if we're trying to recognize if an image is a hot dog versus not a hot dog, now, this one's a lot harder because we don't necessarily know all the features that may pertain to the hot dog. So for example, is it on a bun or not on a bun? Is it in a hand or on a plate? Or is there condiments on it or not condiments on it? And, and, and so it, this one would be much more challenging to create a system of rules that would be applied to give us an output like this, where the, the machine learning uh, algorithm could say, yes, it's a hot dog or no, it's not a hot dog. So in this case, we wouldn't be able to define the features. We would have to use a process called uh, deep learning and create a deep learning model. Now, deep learning models more are patterned after the, the neural network of the brain in that we give an input and then the deep learning model actually creates its own associations that we actually aren't, aren't privy to all of those. So it'll, it'll start recognizing patterns and then it'll come up with its own output based on what it thinks you're trying to get it to learn. Now, because we're not defining all the features, we have to feed it an incredible amount of data. If I give the, the model one picture to train on and there's a dog and there's a cat in the picture, it won't know which one I'm trying to, to teach it. But if I give it a thousand pictures and it recognizes that there's the pattern of the dog shape, now it'll start to recognize that there's a dog on those images. And as you build that 
even greater to 100,000 images, then you start to get a lot of accuracy in your models. And, and again, this is very similar to how a toddler, for example, is taught. So this is a popular children's toy here on the left. Uh, if you give this to a toddler for the first time, they're going to struggle with it. They're not going to recognize, A, what they're supposed to do. They're going to not know where the pieces go in there. And it's going to take them a lot of time to figure out where one of those pieces gets inputted. But the more times they're exposed to this toy, the more associations their brain is creating until eventually you can give it to them. And without much effort at all, they'll turn that block to the right spot and they'll put one of those shapes in the right spot. And that's because their brain is learning and is creating these associations. So that, that's similar in theory to the deep learning model, how it's creating its own associations and recognizing for patterns. So let's bring this back to dentistry, okay? So how are artificial intelligence models trained within dentistry? So we use what's called a supervised learning process. So this is a form of, of deep learning, but it's a supervised deep learning. So instead of just feeding it a bunch of raw x-rays and then hoping it can tell that we're looking for caries, for example, on an x-ray, we actually hand annotate every x-ray that goes through the machine learning model. And so the way that's done is we have a team of licensed dentists that will hand annotate whatever it is we're trying to teach the, that particular model. So for caries, the dentist will go through and they will outline all of the caries that they detect on those x-rays. Now, because it's hard to get two doctors to agree 100% of the time when there's caries or when there's not, usually there's multiple instances of the same x-ray being outlined by multiple clinicians to try to get some sort of consensus between them. So what that means is our AI models are taught from millions of clinical data points. Now, one, one image will recognize a, a dozen clinical data points. You have DJs and enamels and, and caries and things like that. Uh, it's enough where it would take multiple clinical lifetimes of radiographic interpretation for you to have the same experience that this machine learning model has. Now, that doesn't mean it's smarter than you. That just means it takes that much data to train the AI model. Um, and it's only getting smarter. What I tell people is today's the dumbest it's ever going to be because we continually feed it more data and it continues to improve in its accuracy. And so now what that means is that we can take a, an x-ray that the artificial intelligence has never seen before, um, one that it was not trained on, and we can run it through this deep learning model. And what Overjet's going to try to do here is it's going to try to label that x-ray in a manner that it would anticipate a dentist would have labeled it. So it's trained by a labeling method. And so it's going to try to label that x-ray in that same manner. And so it's going to label anything it's been trained on, which, it, which is a number of different areas. And we'll go through that here in just a moment. Now, what you're seeing here uh, and, and the way we describe our, our models is we, we use what's called a segmentation-based quantification model system. Now, that, that's a fancy way of saying that one image that you see there on the left was put through about a dozen or more different models. And each of those models recognizes something different. So for example, we have a model that'll recognize CEJ points. We've got a model that'll recognize enamel, that'll recognize restorations, bone, um, calculus, caries, uh, restorations, all, all the features that you as a dentist or a clinician would look at and recognize in an X-ray. We have a model that recognizes that for uh, these, these particular X-rays. Now, the reason I bring that up is because this is actually a complicated way. The segmentation method is a complicated way to, to perform the AI analysis. And most other AI companies will do what's called a bounded box-based detection model. Um, and the reason for that is it's quicker to train because you, the, the computer doesn't have to be as specific. It doesn't have to outline every area. And it's easier to get FDA clearance for a detection model because um, it leaves more to the clinician and less to the AI. And so that, that's why uh, you know, we, we've taken the time to go through and really build these models so that we can quantify exactly where on these x-rays the findings are. Now, uh, I'd like to go through and just describe some of these models for you so you can see really what the capabilities of the AI are today. Now, the, the first model that we really had to develop was just the one to be able to recognize a radiograph. Uh, which doesn't sound very sexy, but really, if if we feed it an intraoral image, for example, and something that's not been trained on, it'll spit that out and recognize that it's not an X-ray. And then, if we do feed it an X-ray, it'll recognize: is this a bite wing, a panoramic? Is this a, um, a periapical film? And then it'll be able to uh, to uh, apply the appropriate models based on the type of image it is. And, and that's really the the core fundamental. But really, the the first mostly useful one is the tooth identification. Um, now, as clinicians, we spent our entire training, four years of dental school or two or three years of hygiene school, uh, looking at radiographs and learning tooth numbers. And then we spent our entire careers looking at these x-rays. And with a pretty high degree of accuracy, we can identify a tooth number on an x-ray. If this x-ray was not labeled and I asked you all to identify tooth number 19, the vast majority of you would identify that correctly. 
Um, but it's actually remarkably challenging to teach an AI platform to be able to do that. And, and that's because as clinicians, we're, we're taking into a lot of account, right? We're taking into account the orientation of the film. We're taking into account the location of the tooth on that film, the anatomical features and shape of that tooth. And we're using that all to make that inference. And, um, but what we found is that if we weren't able to do that, it really would blunt the impact of the AI because we might say, hey, there's caries on this x-ray. But if we didn't identify the tooth, it's not really clinically that relevant. But now we can say, on the mesial of tooth number 19 carries as present and we can make clinical recommendations based off of it. So the, the next uh, AI, um, AI model, and this is really the, the first one that we received our FDA clearance on. And this is um, you know, the one that Overjet is probably best known for. And it's why uh, Tanya and Perio Protector here with, us, here with us tonight. This is our periodontal AI findings. So Overjet is actually the only AI platform that has FDA clearance for bone level measurements. And what that means is we can take two reference points. So in this case, we're taking the CEJ and we're taking the bone points because we have models that recognize both of those. And now we can measure the distance between those two points. And we actually have a patent on what we call pixel to millimeter conversion without an assistance device. And so to explain that a little bit better, what that means is on a bite wing x-ray, we can, with an accuracy of three tenths of a millimeter, convert the distance in pixels on the film to a distance in millimeters. And it's, it's kind of a complicated process. It involves identifying the type of, of uh, sensor that it was taken on based on counting X and Y uh, access of pixels, um, factoring and magnification factors, and a whole bunch of other engineering stuff that's over my head. Um, but really that's significant because now we can start to apply thresholds to bone levels and we can start using this to make objective based uh, treatment decisions for our patients. And now in an automated fashion, you know, that first x-ray that I showed that I said, how much bone loss is there? Well, now you can automatically have bone levels on every x-ray that you look at. Um, and uh, the AAP as of 2018, they're actually their preferred method to look at bone levels is in a ratio, so a percentage, but that requires a periapical film with the, with the apex. And so if there was a PA, we actually would show that as a percentage rather than as a millimeter like you see in the bite. Um, and then also because we can detect uh, where the enamel is and we can detect where the root surface is and we can detect where calculus is. And again, those are all different models. We can combine those models and now we can say, okay, is there calculus present? And if so, is this enamel-based calculus or is this root surface calculus? And then is there a different treatment modality that we as providers can or should apply to those different, those different uh, scenarios? Um, and, and really the, the gist of this, and we're gonna talk about this in quite a bit more depth here in, in a little bit, is this really helps standardize the best practices in our periodontal programs. And that's one of the biggest challenges I see as I work with DSOs and, and consult with DSOs is just the lack of, of standardized expectations between uh, the, the dentist and the hygienist. And then we, we talked about this uh, a little bit earlier, but just to touch on this again. So because we can quantify uh, caries and we can detect where the enamel is, we can detect where the caries is, we, we can combine those models and we can start now to label if caries are incipient in nature, so they're contained within the enamel, or are they larger, they're past the DEJ and, and they're into the dentin. And, and as clinicians, we recognize that the way that you treat incipient versus non-incipient lesions can be very, can be very different. Um, now, one thing that artificial intelligence doesn't do, nor should it, is tell you how to treat something. What it does is it flags something for you. It'll give you an estimation of size. It'll show you roughly where it's located on that tooth. And then you can use that to your determination if you're going to render uh, treatment through a re restoration or other treatment. <clears throat> So we also have findings that are really impactful for our endodontic and our root canal therapy. So, and, and th these are models that are really in development that uh, we think are gonna be very impactful at some point in the near future. So the first is being able to detect, A, that the root canal is present, that there's been an obturation of a tooth, and then being able to detect the quality of the obturation. So we can detect voids within a root canal space. We can detect uh, the proximity to the, the radiographic apex. Uh, on a tooth to determine are we overfilled, are we underfilled. Uh, we can detect if there's leakage of sealer past the apex. Um, and, and really I think the significance of this is we can now start to track quality of treatment over time. And, and that's really what, what AI's primary use should be is tracking and improving quality of outcomes. Um, and if we're able to, to do this in an automated fashion, rather than relying on clinicians to go back and review x-rays and compare x-rays, I think the outcomes will be significantly improved for our patients. And then we can also detect if there's separated files on an x-ray. So you could, you could track and detect separated files and then track those over time. You could track uh, if they're causing uh, radiolucencies. 
Um, and then one thing that we're, we're interested in that, that we're still working through the engineering feet behind it is, could we, could we potentially get an instantaneous working length from a periapical film? Obviously there's challenges with elongation or foreshortening, um, but, but we think at some point you'll be able to take a PA and it would give you a good estimation of working length from that PA automatically. Now we're also able to detect periapical radiolucencies. And uh, th this is a model again, that's under development, but what would the impact of this? So what, what's interesting is that periapical radiolucencies are actually really quite underdiagnosed in dentistry. And the reason for that is these typically show up as an incidental finding on another X-ray. You're, you're not typically looking for this um, unless the patients come in with a you know limited exam with a chief complaint of pain or something like that. Usually that's because you'd find these incidentally on a crown seat appointment or your, your PAs as you're doing FMXs. Um, and unless the patient has symptoms as providers, sometimes we struggle to diagnose these and then to know what treatment we should render. Well, what if this could be identified in an automated fashion, making it easier to communicate to your patient, hey, there's something here that we should do or we should monitor, um, communicating with your specialists, um, and, and does this improve our patient outcomes? And I think the answer to that is, is certainly yes. And then finally, we're also able to look at panoramic x-rays. So our panoramic x-rays uh, are primarily at this point used for third molar detection and impaction uh, calculations. And so this is, real, this is really significant for offices that do third molar extractions. Uh, what the models do is it detects the level of the alveolar bone and then calculates the percent of the clinical crown that's either above or below uh, the alveolar bone to be able to determine the percentage of that tooth that's impacted. And so as you're treatment planning, uh, these impactions, if you're going to extract them, this will give you the sense of this is going to be a complete bony, partial bony, or soft tissue uh, impaction, and give you the confidence that the insurance will agree with you when you submit that ticket uh, for payment. So you can quote your patients more accurately and more rapidly, and it can simplify your consultation process. And then there's, there's a lot of other things that artificial intelligence will be able to do. Um, I, I think two-dimensional radiography is really the tip of the iceberg. That, that's where it makes sense to start. That's where the data is the most consistent. Um, but, but really, I think the next frontier of this will be uh, artificial intelligence on intraoral scans and intraoral photos, uh, bringing in 3D radiography to this, and then maybe even, even combining some medical and dental applications. So artificial intelligence can do a lot right now. It's making a significant impact, and you'll see that here in a moment. Um, but I think where it's going to be in 12 months and 24 months is even going to be mind-boggling compared to where it's at now. So I think it's going to be an exciting journey for artificial intelligence. But I, th I think that still begs us to make the case for does dentistry need artificial intelligence? Are, are we creating something just because we can, or are we creating something that's actually going to solve a problem? And, and what I'm going to show you, there's, there's really three issues that artificial intelligence is addressing. So the first two we talked about a little bit, diagnostic standardization. And the second one was, was trust. And we're going to talk about patient uh, case acceptance. And then the, the third one I want to talk about is improving the diagnostic confidence of the providers. So for diagnostic standardization, I, I want to give you one more example of, of what I'm talking about here. So this is an image that, we, that we, an x-ray that we use in the early days of Overjet. And this x-ray, the blue boxes are the correctly labeled caries on this film. And we gave the unlabeled, unlabeled version of this to 75 licensed dentists. And we asked them in the program that we were using to outline in blue any areas of primary decay and outline in yellow any areas of secondary recurrent caries. And the results were uh, a little different from what the ground truth was. And you can see that the results aggregated from these 75 dentists show that every single tooth and almost every single surface was diagnosed as needing a restoration. And Imagine you're this patient and for one doctor, you get the treatment plan on the left and the other doctor, you get the treatment plan on the right. What impact does this have on you? How does this affect your confidence, your trust, your, your ultimately your ability or desire to, to, to accept treatment from either of these doctors? And, and how, can we, how can we use artificial intelligence to standardize this? Well, to talk about this, I wanna bring this more to the, the hygiene uh, discussion. So I want to give you a, a theoretical situation. It's actually a real patient, but I'm not going to give you all the details of this patient. Um, and I know it's not fair to you, but I think it's good for this exercise. So on this patient, they had generalized four and five millimeter pockets on the upper right and lower right quadrants with moderate bleeding on probing. So as a clinician, I often will have a hygienist that comes in and they have a new patient. I'm in the middle of doing something in my office or getting ready to go do something. So I get like the, the real short cliff notes version of, of their entire exam process that they've gone through so far with the hygienist. And sometimes this, these are the bullet points, 
right? And really what, what, what the hygienist is asking for is validation for what they, what they want to do. So in your mind, if this was the information you were given, obviously there's other information you would need to make a definitive uh, diagnosis and treatment plan. Um, but what treatment comes to your mind? What, 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 what is the, the, the treatment that seems more, most appropriate in this situation? Well, in, in dental school, for sure, I, I would have said that this had been scaling and replaning, you know, every time. Four and five millimeter pockets that are that are bleeding. That sounds like SRP to me. Well, now let's introduce a little bit more information. Let's bring an X-ray into it with a little bit of artificial intelligence overlaid on the top. Now, does this change your decision for treatment that you want to render? Does this change uh, the discussion that you're going to have with the patient, the way that you're going to approach this, patient? and how does it change it? So. Really, to have this discussion, we need to bring some of the literature into the discussion. So the, the literature states that less than two millimeters, so 1.9 millimeters or less from the CEJ to the crestal bone is indicative of biological normality. So that's evidence of no radiographic bone loss, okay? So in this particular case, we have a patient that at most has look like 1.3 millimeters of a bone level measurement. Now it's important as we're looking at these x-rays, what you're seeing on these millimeters are not bone loss measurements, okay? It's not saying there's 1.3 millimeters of bone loss uh, on, the, on the distal of 28 there. What that's saying is that the distance from the CJ to the crestal bone is 1.3 millimeters on that spot. And then it's up to you as a clinician to determine is that bone loss? And the literature would state that, well, at, at less than two millimeters, it's really, we really don't consider that bone loss at this point. So if we go back to this patient, what is our treatment plan recommendation now? Are we doing scaling and replaning? Right. Is there some other treatment that we could render? Um, now, the AEP has, a, as of 2018, they updated their guidelines for a, a fairly complex staging and grading criteria. Um, what I found as I've been consulting with DSOs is that um, staging and grading is not the challenge that the DSOs are having. It's getting their, their clinicians to perio They're not quite to the staging and grading step. They're trying to get their, their uh, hygienist to, to probe for patients. Um, you know, so so one thing that we do at, at Overjet is we calculate the percentage of patients who have an active perio chart, and the numbers would would astound you. There's offices that I've that I've had discussions with that 98% of their patients did not have a current perio chart, meaning it's been 12 months or more since that patient's last last perio chart. Now I wouldn't say that's average. For average, we probably see about 60 to 65% of patients that do not have a current perio chart. So. The reason I say that is what I'm going to show you here is a modified version of the ADA hygiene workflow. This is a much, this is much simpler than staging and grading. I think this is, this is, if you're going to start a standardization protocol for your hygiene teams in your office, this would be a good place to start. Now there's some periodontists on here and, and some offices that have a very advanced hygiene programs that you're going to recognize. There's a lot of stuff missing from this protocol, uh, such as irrigation and, and laser therapy and things like that. And that all could be added in here, but, but just uh, for this presentation, I wanted to keep this pretty simple. So what this represents is, is the patient comes in and uh, we do an oral evaluation and we're presented with one of four clinical scenarios from a hygiene case. Okay. And I want to walk through these because I think this is important to show you how you could standardize your hygiene protocols and treatment expectations. So if your patient comes in and they have, and we're going to start left and then go to the right. So if they have no or minimal inflammation, now, what does that mean? So for, for this discussion, we're going to say that that's less than or equal to three millimeter probing depths all around. Okay. So we're going to say that's evidence of no or minimal inflammation. What is your treatment expectation from your hygiene team? Well, in that case, I think, I think essentially everybody would agree that we're going to do a prophylaxis, either an adult or a child prophylaxis, and put them on a six-month recall. That's kind of your standard patient. This is where hopefully most of your patients fall into. Well, what if they have some mild or localized inflammation, but there's no bone loss? So now we're in that, that second column here. Well, what is that defined as? So we're going to define that as probing depths of isolated probing depths, excuse me, of four millimeters or more, but their bone level measurements are normal. So for this document, I put less than 2.5. This is adjustable, right? We know anything above two is starting to be evidence of bone loss. And we know anything above three millimeters that the AP as of their 2015 guidelines, we would have called that moderate radiographic bone loss. So, um, you know, using that data, I, I used 2.5 for this, but ultimately if you were implementing this in your practice, you would modify these so it fits your clinical criteria. So they have isolated probing depths and they've got some bone level measurements that are that are general, generally healthy. So there's no bone loss and a little bit of inflammation. What are we going to do? Are we still going to do a prophy or is there something more we can do? Well, 
typically we would still do a profi, but maybe we would modify. Maybe we were adding in some extra oral, oral hygiene instruction. Maybe we're modifying the recall sequence. You know, maybe we're going to three or four or six month recall uh, for this patient to, to try to monitor this localized gingivitis that they're having. Okay, well, now what if they have uh, generalized moderate ging gingival inflammation? So they're moderate or severe. Um, it's more generalized. And we're going to define that as four or more millimeter probing depths on over 30% of their teeth. Okay, but, but they still have healthy bone level measurements. Okay, so this is the case that we just described uh, pr previously. So that that's this x-ray here, right? This is generalized uh, gingival inflammation, but we're still having normal probing depths. Okay, so what is our treatment going to be in this case? And again, the point of this lecture isn't to be on, on the this decision tree per se, but I want to show you how we're using the AI uh, involved to help make this uh, standardization. So in this case, we would do the D4 to 346, the scaling in the presence of gingival inflammation. So we're going to render that treatment, and then we're going to bring them back in two to four weeks, and we're going to do a profi, and then we're going to put them on some profi recall um, and monitor their probing depths and their bone level measurements to see if there's progression or if we get to have disease resolution. Okay, and, and this ultimately is, this is where you want to catch your patients, ideally before this, but here, this, this is the patient that still has a chance, right? They don't have bone loss. They had gingivitis that hasn't turned into periodontal disease with, with irreversible bone loss. And so you're doing your patients a favor by catching that and providing treatment and not just putting them on a six month profi because, because you don't think they need scaling and replaning. And then of course, the last case is, is the patient that has uh, gingival inflammation with radiographic bone loss. So they have bone level measurements that are over 2.5 millimeters. Uh, they've got probing depths that are four millimeters or more. And then we're going to provide either isolated or a, a full quadrant of scaling for, for any teeth that, uh, that require scaling. So this process that we just did, right? If I was sitting in my office and I was doing this process with my hygiene teams, this is called standardization. This is creating uniform clinical criteria that we can use as a team and apply uniformly across all of our patients. Now, of course, there's going to be uh, certain patients that uh, have some extenuating circumstances or or maybe they're a smoker or a diabetic, and so you're going to elevate them on this. And so you're going to make some exceptions for that. But by and large, the vast majority of your patients could be described in situations such as this. And so you've now given your hygiene teams the ability to use the artificial intelligence to get the numbers they need and not have to necessarily come ask for permission, right? Now you're, you're the doctor, you're going to confirm the diagnosis, but they already know what criteria you're using because you've standardized it. Um, and of course, in all of this, uh, you know, as part of your treatment modality, if you were building this out for yourself, um, you know, you would add gingival irrigation and laser therapy, and, and maybe you'd include Protect as part of your, your uh, protocol for some of this as well. So the second area that artificial intelligence is really poised to make a big impact is on patient case acceptance. So case acceptance in, in dentistry is, is really abysmal. I mean, to be honest, we should be ashamed of ourselves at how low uh, case acceptance is. For an established patient, nationwide average is 52% case acceptance. So this means a patient you have a relationship uh, with, they've seen you before, essentially you can flip a coin and it's going to determine if they're going to accept treatment or not. And then I think as we all ex would expect, uh, new patients, that's even significantly lower. So it drops down to 30% case acceptance nationwide for new patients. So I'm going to cut right to the chase. What impact does, does artificial intelligence have on these patients? Well, we know through a lot of data that we've, that we've studied that average case acceptance increase by patients who are exposed to AI during the treatment planning process is 21% increased. So imagine in your practice, what does a 21% increase in case acceptance do for the quality of care that your patients are getting, for the quality of outcomes, for the quality of uh, your your um, financial metrics that, that you're monitoring. Um, now, of course, I think it's important to note that at, over, at Overjet, and, and hopefully this is true at every artificial intelligence program, our goal is not to get you to have, uh, to, to re reap financial benefits from artificial intelligence and overdiagnose. Actually, one of our founding pillars at, at Overjet is clinical conservatism and trying to help be the safety net, um, you know, helping you catch things that maybe you would have otherwise missed. And when we're talking about case acceptance, this is the stuff that you've actually already diagnosed, right? This may or may not have even been with the aid of artificial intelligence. This is just helping the patient overcome that barrier that they're feeling for their case acceptance. And I think it's important to talk about how does artificial intelligence do this? How does it help help the patient increase their case acceptance? Uh, really, it's it's all about trust, right? For the patient, it's it's all about the, the, that trust or that lack of trust that they have in their providers. And I think it's easy to demonstrate why. So in these two radiographs here, 
the radiograph on the left is the image that your patients are used to seeing, right? This is what they see in your offices right now. Uh, it's black and white. They don't understand. Things that are obvious to clinicians uh, mean almost nothing to, to patients. In fact, in my own office, prior to using artificial intelligence, I actually had stopped showing most x-rays of patients. It was either intraoral photo or I, or I would just sit there and talk to them because I felt like it really wasn't providing much benefit. Well, compare the x-ray on the left with the x-ray on the right. Now, if I want to describe the caries on the mesial of 18, how much easier is that conversation? When I want to talk about uh, elevated bone level measurement on the uh, distal of, of 21, uh, for example, um, and talk about how we need to increase our flossing and things, uh, how much easier is that conversation when I have an actual measurement that I can show them and, and tell them? Um, and so what this does is this really plays at one of the core drivers of trust. Okay, so the three core drivers of trust are authenticity, logic, and empathy. And, and this is actually uh, one of my favorite topics. I, I could talk for an hour just, just on, on, on trust and the core drivers of trust. And in a dental office, if we go through these, authenticity, that's, that's them experiencing you not as the doctor you, but as the real you or not as the hygiene you. This is why pictures of you uh, on a fishing trip with your kids on the counter are so impactful because uh, it helps build authenticity to the provider so that they feel like they're experiencing the real version of you and it helps build trust. Um, empathy is the patient feeling and believing that you actually care about them as an individual and that you want what's best for them. And so when you're treatment planning and making decisions, you're not looking at that from a selfish standpoint, but you're looking at that from an empathetic standpoint to give them the best outcomes. And then logic, and this is really the one that artificial intelligence, I think, uh, influences the most. Logic is your patients believe that you can do what you're going to say and that they believe and understand the diagnosis that you made. And so if we look at those x-rays again, artificial intelligence really helps in, in, increase their, their ability to believe the logic that you have, that your treatment plan is accurate, correct, and that you're using sound judgment on it. And that's why it's so impactful. And that's why we're seeing, and these numbers are early. I think we're going to see these numbers continue to increase as, as organizations uh, become better at implementing uh, artificial intelligence in their practices. But that's why we're seeing 21% increase in patient case acceptance, because we're helping overcome one of those drivers of trust or the lack of, of trust that they have in, in the providers. And the, the third one that I want to talk about here is improving the diagnostic confidence. Um, uh, and this is specifically of, of dentists and hygienists, actually. So it, if you were to ask your patients, most patients would say that over-treatment and over-diagnosis is an issue in dentistry. Um, the reality is the data doesn't support that. By and large, clinicians want what's best for the patients. They do the right thing and they try their best. Um, but the reality is underdiagnosis is really the larger problem than overdiagnosis. In fact, for restorative treatment nationwide, the average is 28% of restorative treatment goes undiagnosed. Um, and periodontal disease is, is significantly higher. So 60% of periodontal disease goes undiagnosed. So almost two thirds of the periodontal disease in our practices were not adequately diagnosing. And again, that's not malicious for the most part from, from clinicians. That's, that's clinicians are busy. There's, you know, that, that one patient is not your only patient that day. You've got, uh, you know, while you're doing that hygiene exam, you may have two, three, four other hygiene exams at the same time, plus two columns of treatment. Uh, and, and you're trying to do the best you can on each x-ray, but the reality is we're human and we can only do as much as we're able to do. And so with the power of artificial intelligence, with it helping automate uh, the detection of suspected caries and bone level measurements, what we found is on the restorative side, we're seeing a 23% increase in restorative procedures diagnosed per exam by providers who use artificial intelligence than providers who don't. And again, I think this is, you know, I, I just said this, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, this doesn't represent over-treatment. Our goal is not to drive over-treatment in your offices. In fact, I, I don't care. If you implement uh, overjet in your practice tomorrow, my goal would not to be to get you to diagnose more. The goal would be to get you to diagnose more accurately, more appropriately, and more confidently. And for most providers, that does mean that you'll end up you'll end up diagnosing more. But there certainly are providers out there who may end up diagnosing less using artificial intelligence. Um, so I have just a couple of minutes before I want to turn over to Tanya, where she can help uh, uh, talk about Perio uh, Protect and how it can help be involved in that decision tree uh, for our periodontal treatments. But I want to go through just a couple of set of sets of X-rays here in the last couple of minutes. This, this first case, and I recognize that this is a webinar format and this probably isn't ideal condition to look at an x-ray, but the backstory of this x-ray is actually really interesting and it's going to be very similar to that story I told at the beginning of the, uh, of the webinar. Um, this x 
history was given to us unsolicited by a DSO who was not our customer. And they asked if we would be able to run our AI on these x-rays and hand it back to them. And there really wasn't any backstory that was, you know, and, and that's not a super unusual request. We get that from time to time. So we did the AI analysis, we sent it back to them. And then they emailed us, emailed us back and said that they uh, were very grateful that we did that because our AI findings were 100% aligned with their doctors. And the reason they sent that is they had a new patient who was irate with their new doctor uh, at the number of, uh, number of cavities that they diagnosed. And so I wanna show these on there now. We're not usually 100% in lockstep with, with clinicians. That's not really the goal, right? You, you as a clinician should look at the findings and use your clinical judgment and determine if, if it's appropriate or not. And again, Overjet also doesn't make determination for appropriateness of treatment. Uh, but you can see here, and I'll toggle back and forth a little bit just so you can uh, see these areas. Overjet is highlighting areas of incipient caries in uh, yellow, and it's highlighting areas of non-incipient or cavitated lesions into the dentin in, in red. So from a restorative standpoint, um, think of the conversation you're having with your patient with these x-rays versus the conversation you're having with your patient with these x-rays. And, and I've tried the whole show them an incipient caries on a radiograph type thing to try to get them to accept fluoride treatment. And it's really difficult to have that conversation because most dentists have trouble identifying incipient caries. How am I going to get the patient to identify it? And so uh, being able to do this in an automated fashion and have a meaningful conversation will really, is, is really impactful. <clears throat> And on this next one, so the, the X-ray on the left, this is the bite wing that I, I showed earlier in the program. Uh, and now we're gonna see the bite wing on the left side as well. Um, but again, being able to detect caries, being able to detect bone levels, being able to detect calculus and then have a meaningful conversation with your, with your patient. You can see the ability to talk to your patient and show your patient these X-rays is, is really significant. And I think that the most impactful thing for me on here is the ability to show the patient the bone level measurements. Um, you know, some of this carries, you could show the patient on the x-ray and even they would see some of these carries. Uh, but the bone levels is really hard for patients to understand. They just don't understand CEJ points and bone points and, and you know, trying to compare distances between them. But now you can show them and you can see that on that, that uh, patient right between two and three, the number turned to red when it hit three millimeters. So it hit moderate radiographic bone loss. So Overjet's going to flag that to make sure that, that, that you're looking at that. And it'll actually combine that with your periotarding data. So if you have four plus millimeter pocket and the three plus millimeter bone level measurement, and you never diagnose scaling and root planning, Overjet would flag that as a potential uh, candidate for, for SRP or periodontal therapy. So again, trying to be the safety net for clinicians to, to make sure if it hits a certain point that you've at least had the opportunity to review and, and then make the clinical de determination off of that. And uh, last thing I want to point to before I'm going to turn it over to Tanya here, uh, artificial intelligence can be used in a, in a number of applications. So uh, in this particular application, we're looking at tooth number 19. This is that same bite wing from, from the previous image. And in the platform, we actually calculate this value called DMF, which stands for decayed, missing, or filled. And it's specific to the percentage of that individual tooth. So tooth number 19 on this two-dimensional x-ray that has caries, fracture, or an existing restoration. So decayed, missing, or filled. And in two dimensions, Overjet has calculated that 40% of that tooth has caries, uh, fracture, or an existing restoration. Now, what can you do with that information? You can use this to help to aid your determination if you feel like the tooth would need a crown. You can use this to aid in your, uh, your clinical determination when you're submitting your claim to insurance companies to help automate approvals. Um, and you can use this to communicate to patients uh, on the percentage of the tooth that uh, is affected and, and, and why you're recommending specific treatment. And again, o Overjet doesn't make a determination for what the treatment is. It may still be that a large filling here is the best treatment. It's just giving you the information so that you can help calculate that. Now, the, the last thing I just wanna skip to you here uh, is how artificial intelligence impacts your daily clinic operations. Um, the one I wanna highlight is there, there is certainly a connection between artificial intelligence and the clinical practice and artificial intelligence and the administration of insurance claims, which I know is a touchy subject as a clinician. Uh, there, there can be occasionally some animosity between clinical pro providers and insurance payers, but really you'll find as insurance payers start implementing artificial intelligence in their platforms that they're able to speed their claims reviews up significantly. And I think most importantly from a clinical side is they're able to standardize their claims adjudication, meaning on a scaling or root planing claim, they'll have access and the ability to look at the bone level measurements the same as a clinician would. So rather than the clinician looking at an x-ray and saying, yep, that looks like bone loss. And then an insurance company looking at the x-ray and saying, no, that doesn't look like bone loss. Now, 
both uh, individuals have the ability to see the same objective information and apply the same logic under adjudication. So uh, I, I'm gonna stop there. I wanna make sure Tanya's got enough uh, time for her presentation, um, but thank you guys for your, your time and attention. And at the end, we'll have some time for, for Q&A. So Tanya, if you're ready, I will stop sharing and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always fascinating to hear what's going on uh, with Overjet and the capabilities here. So I really appreciate this. And so I just want to start by saying Overjet is going to give you, you a new way or AI will give you a new way to be able to talk to patients. And our goal at PeriProtect is to put periodontal disease into remission and prevent its reoccurrence. You can't do that if you don't diagnose it. Yeah. Rob, your numbers were 60% undiagnosed. Um, Dental Intel's numbers are at 8% of their millions of treatment plans are for scaling and only 4% is accepted. So we want to be able to address this really well for patients. Um, I am hoping you're seeing the right screen here. Let's see. We're good. Okay, thanks, Lisa. I didn't get to pick it that time. It just remembered my last choice. So what Perio Protect does is gives you an excellent home care option, adjunctive therapy for treating periodontal disease, both in the post-antibiotic age and now in this AI revolution where you have a new, renewed urgency or a new urgency for treatment because patients really can visualize the concerns you have for their health and wellness. And we need this help. Oral biofilm grows so fast. The human mouth is the perfect incubator. It's warm, it's moist, there's an ample food supply. The image you're seeing is from a scanning electron microscope of a carrier. It had been sterile. It was placed into a six millimeter pocket and left in there for just 48 hours. 48 hours. Your patients, if they have pockets deeper than three millimeters, they don't stand a chance. Toothbrush, rinse, and floss just cannot get deep enough. And so the cycle continues and it's a chronic infectious cycle. And I just want to posit this. We have used antibiotics in dentistry for decades. If they were going to work well, we would not have 47% of Americans over the age of 30 with periodontal disease and, or 70% by the time we get to 65. And the CDC tells us that we are in the post-antibiotic age already, meaning that our antibiotics are no longer working as effectively as they used to. And I'll just put out there that this is a confusing topic for dentists. Um, you have a lot of competing positions that are encouraging you actually to prescribe antibiotics. And the rules have changed also. So to be sympathetic, let's, I, I, I am, um, but let's just put some stats out there. Dentists are the number three prescribers of oral antibiotics in post in post in outpatient settings. And dentists are the number one prescribers of clindamycin in outpatient settings. And clindamycin has one of the highest associated risks with the C. diff infection as a result. So we need non-antibiotic options. And hydrogen peroxide is an excellent broad spectrum antimicrobial. This is not the only drug you might deliver with this tray. It's just the one that's been tested extensively in controlled clinical trials and long-term studies. Tray delivers the medication deep Medication is what's causing this effect. And then just think of hydrogen peroxide. It is a broad spectrum antimicrobial agent. It does two things primarily. It kills bacteria and it oxygenates the pocket. You are oxygenating the microenvironment of the periodontal pocket. And that is super important because you are creating a toxic environment for your most virulent pathogens, your gram-negative obligate anaerobes, and you are creating the right environment, a healthy environment, for healthy bacteria to repopulate, the ones that can exist well in oxygen, at the expense of the pathogen. The gel we are recommending is a 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel. To put that into context, your lowest whitening agent is 10% carbamide peroxide. That's 3.4% hydrogen peroxide. It's just half of that level. We tested 3%. They work really well. They work faster. They just cause a lot more sensitivity. The tray is important as a delivery device. And again, there are other drugs you might consider, but most of the time, hydrogen peroxide is working very effectively. This is what it looks like in the mouth. The blue markings are just the Paraprotec logo, so they know they get the right tray. This is the only tray on the market that has been cleared by FDA for deep delivery into the periodontal pocket. 
And all the research I'm gonna show you here tonight um, indicates that when you use this tray to deliver and hold hydrogen peroxide deep into the pockets for at least 10 minutes, 15 minutes is your ideal time point, but 10 minutes is, is, is good. You can reduce bleeding, reduce inflammation, even reduce additional pocket depths, and there are changes in the microbial environment. I wanna give you some ideas. Well, how does it work? There's an internal peripheral seal for every single tooth. We can make a uniform seal for gingivitis or periodontitis, but we like to have your probing scores. That'll help us make the most precise fitting tray. But the seal and the extension beyond it, the tray, that seal and extension combination works like a gasket that prevents the medication from leaking out into the mouth and drives it really deep into the periodontal pocket. Research shows you can get medication into pockets as deep as nine millimeters. That said, this is always adjunctive care. It is designed to supplement at home what you do in the office so you can get better results like this. This is a patient who should come in every three months and does not. Um, she's got that kind of blistered effect. What you're looking at five months later is her results when she added the periotray therapy. Now our goal would be to intervene as early as possible. Take the AI, take your probes, your probing charts, take your intraoral photos, show your patients why you're concerned about the infections and inflammation in their gums, intervene as early as you can. Let's, let's put the disease in remission and prevent its reoccurrence as early as possible, but you can't always. Sometimes you have to do surgery. The top image is the day of surgery. This was Lanap. The middle image is three months later. And I think that's a good surgical outcome. Then they added the tray therapy and they use the trays twice a day for six weeks. Controlled clinical trials show that two for two weeks is actually sufficient. Four is what I like to recommend. Six is what they did here. They've also done a prophy because that the two surfaces are gorgeous, but they're also whiter. And, and you'll get a little bit of whitening from this. It's, it's slow, gradual, no sensitivity. That last part is important. But look at the gum tissue. That is gorgeous tissue, gorgeous tone, gorgeous color. This is treatment that went on for 18 months, scaling first, followed by tray therapy. And in a maintenance protocol like that, you use trays twice a day, and then you drop down to one time a day. And it's really important that we treat patients, not just for their oral health, but also for the implications of chronic systemic inflammation. Thinking about periodontitis as having systemic implications. And it's all about inflammation. Every person has a, their own relative source of inflammation and it accumulates over time. You get this cumulative inflammatory burden. The more sources you have, the greater your risk for inflammatory driven diseases like cardiovascular disease or diabetes and untreated or refractory periodontal disease. And we just heard from Dr. Colt, 60% is undiagnosed. That's truly unacceptable. We really can do better. Um, untreated and refractory perio adds to the cumulative burden. Now you might not go through all of that information to your patients. You might just tell them that their immune system's like a battery. The more things you have hooked up to it, the quicker its power fades. If you have type two diabetes and gum disease, they're both taxing the immune system. The gum disease is a chronic low grade burden. Let's get your gums healthy. Let's unplug the gum disease from your battery. And this is important. We know that bleeding gums lead to higher risks of bacteremia. And the big long-term foundational studies show that if you have persistent gingival bleeding, that those sites, and this is a long-term study, those sites are three times more likely to have clinical attachment loss, to be significantly more likely to be extracted. We also know that if you can get that bleeding under control, it is a highly accurate predictor. It being the control of the bleeding is a highly accurate predictor of no further periodontal damage. And periotray therapy helps you get the bleeding and inflammation under control. This is one of the controlled clinical trials that was done at University Park Research Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana. All, it's, they're standardized, right? All patients have the same toothpaste, the same toothbrush, oral hygiene instructions. Your blue group is using the tray delivery of hydrogen peroxide, the 1.7% hydrogen peroxide, we call it periogel, in the tray. The red group is not. They all get scaled at week three. So this is using trays even before scaling. And that's a better than 50% reduction in, in bleeding on probing. This is presence or absence. Now these are shallow pockets, up to five millimeters. In your deep pockets, which were up to nine millimeters, but most were six, seven, and eights, that's an even better reduction in the first two weeks. I personally think 
the most compelling data comes from this long-term study that goes out for five years. These 66 patients in this study had exhausted their surgical options. There's a handful that don't have enough bone anymore to support surgical intervention, but most of them have exhausted their options. And there was no change in their pocket probing depth scores, adding trait therapy, because their, their pockets were surgically corrected. But their bleeding was out of control. 63% of their sites collectively were bleeding on probing before treatment. Periodontists put them in periotrate therapy twice a day at 10 minutes. 10 is your minimum time point. You really want 15. I'll go over that in a second. But that's a 75% reduction in bleeding on probing in the first six months. And then you see how it flatlines. That tells us two things. One, these are really good results that are long lasting. Patients stay, half of the group, there were 66 patients, 33 stayed twice a day, 33 went down to one time a day. Statistically speaking, there was no difference. So long-term maintenance, we recommend once a day, unless your patient has some extenuating circumstances. Most patients do really well one time a day, 10 to 15 minutes, type is something they do, like take a shower, watch TV, whatever, walk their dog, whatever they do every day. Good results, long-lasting, out to five years, as which was the length of the study. But that flat line also tells you something else. You get what you get by six months. If it has, if you've done initial therapy, you've done at least one round of maintenance, and they've been using their trays for the whole six month period. If it has not resolved, more tray therapy is not gonna help. There's something else. It's usually an endoperial lesion, could still be some subgingival calculus, um, but likely it's a deep vertical defect that has granulominous tissue that needs surgery. Controlled clinical trials also show that you get better pocket depth reductions and they are long lasting also. So Periprotec made a couple of claims that the researchers were testing. One, we argue that you can get some good results with the tray therapy even before scaling and that they are long lasting. So in these six, these are two separate six month controlled clinical trials. They did not do maintenance. You should do maintenance. Um, but they did not just to test how long are those good results. So the first study on the left had two arms. Again, your blue group is using the tray delivery of hydrogen peroxide. The red group is not. And you can see both groups do well at scaling. Scaling is at week three, that gray-white interface. They both do better after scaling. It's just your home care group using the periotray therapy did better. And on the, the second control clinical trial on the right that has three arms, one of the groups had doxycycline and hydrogen peroxide. And it looks like they did worse, but they didn't. There's no statistically uh, significant difference between these two groups. It's just that the doxy group didn't do better. When it comes to treating periodontal disease or any biofilm-based infection, hydrogen peroxide is super effective. And that is because Biofilms can resist antibiotic therapy. There's a lot of reasons why. They're covered in a matrix that's difficult for an antibiotic to penetrate. Both um, hydrogen peroxide and chlorine, for example, can cut through that matrix really effectively to get access to the cells. Your antibiotics typically target particular species. It's a broad spectrum antimicrobial. You don't even need to know what's down there to be really effective, unless you have a refractory area, and then you might do a site-specific sample to find out what's there and what other drug you might want to, you might want to deliver to you. Um, and then, of course, bacteria build up resistances, and they can transmit those resistances both intra and inter species, which is why we tend to be in the post which is why we are, one of the reasons why we are in the post antibiotic age. Additional good news tray therapy, the, the paratray delivery of the hydrogen peroxide gel, works equally well for smokers and non smokers. That is true in both controlled clinical trials and in the five year study. If you're looking at the five year study here, that one um, circle that we have here is our outlier, one outlier. The rest of the smokers did really well. All right, so let's look at some research-based protocols. Uh, maintenance therapy is where most people start. And you think about all your patients who are uh, just struggling between office visits. And I, and I ask you to think about this, and I mean this respectfully. How many bleeding points are acceptable in your practice? I personally do not think you can get everybody to zero but I do believe you can get patients to single digits and you can maintain that health long-term. And that has not just an effect on their oral health, but a really positive effect for their general health and wellness. And if we don't tell patients that they have a disease and that we have good non-antibiotic treatment options, better ways to help them at home, nobody else is. It's, it's an exciting time and it's so exciting and rewarding to see some of the results. So in maintenance therapy, or gingivitis, or you have, um, you're worried about an implant, or you're trying to prevent peri-implant mucositis, or you've got 
um, gingival margins that are that are just chronically bleeding around a, a crown area, you would use the protocol where you work out twice a day and you get down to one time a day. We want them to wear this tray for 15 minutes. 10 minutes is good. They need at least 10 minutes. And I'm trying to figure out where that information is that I skipped over. Uh, 10 minutes is a good kill rate with uh, 10 minutes of oxygen. But if you go for 15 minutes, you get all the oxygen benefits. Periogel is releasing hydrogen peroxide slowly and consistently up to 17 minutes. Your body will eventually absorb both the, the um, oxygen and water that the hydrogen peroxide breaks down to. But if you go for 10 minutes, you get a good kill rate at 10 minutes and you get 10 minutes of oxygen. If you go for 15 minutes, you get almost all the oxygen benefits. If you wear it longer than 15 minutes, it doesn't help you and it doesn't hurt you. My favorite Netflix show is 41 minutes long. I do not get up in the middle of that show. Or I do not get up in the middle of the inning of Cardinals baseball um, to take my trays out. I just leave them in. It's comfortable. I'll get up when I can. Okay, twice a day down to once a day. Here's a case study that um, you saw a little bit earlier. This patient has had significant bone loss. I'd love to see what this looks like with AI. The probing chart, this is Florida Probe Voice Works. We love Florida Probe because of their beautiful colors. If you're not familiar with it, your red diamonds are bleeding points. Your black vertical line is one to three millimeters. Solid blue is four and candy stripes are five and up. Really nice results here. Uh, you're going to about to see, but the, this is beautiful and it tracks it over time for you. You get to see charts. Okay. This patient was recommended to have all of his teeth extracted by two dentists. He's in his 40s. He doesn't want to have his teeth extracted if he can avoid it. Um, so he goes to a periodontist and the periodontist says, no, we'll, we'll scale first and then we'll follow with tray therapy. So four quads of scaling followed with tray therapy, just the hydrogen peroxide gel. But then the first four weeks, they did get to zero bleeding. You don't always get to zero bleeding. And we still have some candy stripes here. We've got some five plus millimeters. But we're going to call this healthier without the bleeding 18 months later. This is what we want for your patients. Think about so all of you who do this beautiful restorative work or cosmetic work, just think how this tray therapy can help you. It is going to give you optimal restorative outcomes, especially if you use AI and you see incipient decay and you want to do some fluoride treatments. This is the most precise fitting fluoride tray you have ever used. It works beautifully in that way. Or if you have patients with xerostomia, this is an awesome option for you. Once a week, use fluoride instead of the hydrogen peroxide gel. We have a lot of different protocols for just of gingivitis, or if you have concerns about root caries, all of these things. The tray is just a delivery device. It's what you put in it that makes it work so well. All right, let's look. This is two weeks of tray therapy. Look what it looks like nine months later. So 15 crowns in their mouth. Almost every single site around those crowns are bleeding. Let's prolong the life of these restorations by giving them healthy gingiva. A really good, healthy foundation can make your restorative results optimal. This is what we want for your patients. We want to get them healthier. The same is true for your implant cases. We're going to go through this quick case. Um, this is a patient who was also recommended to have all of his teeth extracted. They ended up taking out these five. They placed implants at 14 and 15, and this is what those implants looked like two years later. Now, ideally, you would have gotten the disease under control before you place the implants, but a lot of this is up to the patient, right? This patient does not have uh, appropriate home care. And four years into it, so what you're seeing, this the implants here is two years. Four years, they did some DNA testing. High AA counts. Comes in every three months. He's really good about coming in. He likes the dental team. Seven years later, that's 28 office visits later, his counts are off the chart. And the turnaround doesn't come until he takes his home care seriously. And that involved buying a power brush, beginning the air flossing. He started rinsing. He drops out on the rinse. He didn't like the way it tasted. And he starts with tray therapy. That's twice a day. And then you drop down to once a day. And two years after improving his home care, you can see the difference. Those are gorgeous results. And it, this is about keeping the implants healthy, but also keeping your natural teeth, right? Anytime we can keep a natural tooth, we want to. That would be our goal. All right, so let's look at uh, an alternative option, which is treating with trays first. 
before you even do debridement and scaling. This makes the hygiene team's job so much easier. How does hydrogen peroxide work? As an antimicrobial agent, it breaks down protein chains. If you have, let me just go here. If you have a patient who looks like this, this is gonna be a lot of work. This patient will not brush or floss. I suspect it's painful, but for whatever reason, he'll wear trays. He'll wear, and specifically he wore a pair of trays. He starts out in an IRX protocol, IRX, I stands for initial, RX stands for prescription protocol. You use this first in your treatment plan. This is to get the infection and inflammation under better control before you go in and introduce the bacteria into the bloodstream with scaling. But also, the hydrogen peroxide is going to denature the calculus. Hydrogen peroxide as an antimicrobial agent works by breaking down protein chains. You got to hold it in place long enough for it to work. That's why the tray is important. Rinsing won't do this because it doesn't hold it in place long enough. Um, against a bacterial cell wall, there's a bunch of proteins linked together. Hydrogen peroxide will break through those protein chains, lyse the cell wall, your cells are going to die. Calculus is basically a skeleton of protein. It softens it denatures it, makes it like material alba. This is so much easier to remove. It's easier on the hygienist body. It's easier on the patient. It's faster. And over time, you're able to maintain really good, healthy results, combining those in-office procedures with the continued home care. Now, this is after a maintenance appointment. I highly doubt those tooth surfaces are that clean because he's still not brushing and flossing. And let me just be clear, periotray therapy does not replace brushing and flossing. It just makes it better. Use your trays before you brush. It'll The, the hydrogen peroxide held against that tooth surface will break up the biofilm on the tooth surface, make your tooth brushing more effective. In one of the controlled clinical trials, patients were not randomized for plaque, but they did test plaque scores that were using a plaque index. And patients using periotray therapy with the hydrogen peroxide um, did better on the plaque index than patients who did not have that therapy. He went from 100% bleeding and probing down to 6%. This is what we want for patients. We want to get their gums super healthy. Um, all right, so hydrogen peroxide, let's talk a bit about it. It's classified by FDA as an oral debriding agent and an oral wound cleanser. And let's think about your hygiene department. Your patients with chronic periodontitis or even chronic gingivitis, they're coming in with tiny infected lesions all over their gum tissues or maybe localized, but in their gum tissue. Those are chronic oral wounds. Your hygiene department could legitimately be considered a chronic oral wound care center. Let's debride that. Let's clean them up. Hydrogen peroxide debrides the matrix. The matrix is that slimy, protective, physical barrier. Um, it can cut through the matrix to get access to the cells, and then it debrides bacterial cell walls. It also oxygenates the pocket, and this is really important, that oxygen therapy. Your, your, your body will eventually absorb the oxygen in the water, but the presence of that oxygen there is super important, especially in a sealed tray. So remember, the, tra the peri tray has that internal peripheral seal. It's the only tray on the market that has this. And it that sealed tray especially in combination with the extension that works like a gasket, as the hydrogen peroxide is bubbling up, you're releasing oxygen gas, you're increasing the pressure inside the tray. And that's really important because oxygen under pressure helps stimulate the formation of new capillary beds and that neovascularized tissue is going to heal faster. It's going to be stronger. You're going to see stippling in just a, in even a few weeks. Um, no one is allergic to hydrogen peroxide. Every time human beings exhale, there's hydrogen peroxide in your mouth. There's hydrogen peroxide in white blood cells, in human, there's peroxide in uh, human breast milk, and we're all making hydrogen peroxide in our liver right now. Bacteria do not build up resistances the same way they do to antibiotics, which is really nice. And the image here on the left shows two versions of this gel. Peridol X is flavored with xylitol. That's the only difference is our flavoring. It's a sweetener. Okay, so the tray delivers the medication. The medication does the work, but you do have to keep that medication in place long enough for it to work. And how long is it? You need at least 10 minutes. This is the live dead die study I alluded to earlier. This is uh, one of the multiple studies done um, to test the efficacy of the 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel that we eventually chose and branded as perio gel. We tested a lot of gels. They did not all do well at 10 minutes, but this one did it over and over again. Live dead die, you grow the biofilms in the lab, 
They chose Streptococcus mutans, which is interesting because we're talking about perio, why strep mutans? Because strep mutans have the gooeyest matrix that the microbiologists knew they could grow in the lab. So we're testing two things, how long to get through the goo and how long before they kill the cells. You expose the biofilms to the dyes. If the cells pick up green, they're alive. If they pick up red, they're dead. The middle pane, five minute topical application, it's mostly green. If your patients wear the trays with the gel for five minutes, it's not gonna work. But at 10 minutes, that's 100% kill rate. That's not 100% of all the bacteria. You are not sterilizing the periodontal pocket ever with this, with this delivery system of, of peroxide. What you are doing is 100% kill rate of the exposed surface layer that has come into direct contact with hydrogen peroxide. So let's pretend your bacterial communities is shaped like an onion. It's really shaped like a mushroom, but here we go. For our purposes, it's an onion with layers. The tray pushes the medication down and it rests against the surface layer of, of the biofilm community. It cuts through the matrix, through the slime, that's that protective barrier, and then it kills the cells on the surface. Peel away a layer of that onion. It just got one layer smaller. Then you take the tray out of your mouth. What happens? The bacteria repopulate. Get it with your second treatment. In maintenance, you start out with two treatments. So in the morning, another layer. In the evening, another layer. In the morning, another layer. You skip one in the morning to two at night. Separate it by an hour. In the first couple of weeks, you are going to significantly decrease the bacterial load, but you're never going to sterilize those. So what happens, what tends to happen, is that you end up with a different microbial concentration of healthy bacteria. Those tend to be facultative anaerobes and aerobic bacteria at the expense of the gram-negative albuminates. Okay, so 10 minutes is good. I really want them to wear it for 15 minutes again because you're getting the full oxygen benefits. Periogel breaks down into oxygen and water at 17 minutes. And it does matter what gel you use. We've tested a lot of gels. Um, and uh, the one that we ended up branding for use is the one that consistently did well and the others did not do well. It could take 20 minutes um, and take care. There's a gel out there on the market that calls itself um, or says it's like our gel and it has formaldehyde releasing agents that cause itching and burning. Just know your ingredients. All right, um, uh, side effects. So the known side effects are really pretty happy. They're fresh breath and whiter teeth. Um, so if you can smell your patients before you can see them and they have periodontitis, periotray therapy with the hydrogen peroxide gel should knock out the odor in the first week. It is such a nice side effect for your patients and their loved ones. They will whiten also. Um, this particular patient, I got to meet him about six years ago. He's such a nice man. He's thrilled about his white teeth. What do you care about? You care about those healthy gums. I mean, you care about his white teeth too, but really we're all in for his health, right? Those are gums of a teenager and he is 68 years old when that picture was taken. He'd been in periotray therapy for 10 years. His periodontist had treated him. They'd surgically corrected the pockets. They couldn't get the inflammation and the bleeding under control, put him in trays. Those are nice results. And do patients post pictures of themselves about how their gums are healthy? No, they, but they get really excited about their white teeth. So especially if you have young patients, well, what am I saying? The guy was 68. Everybody likes to have white teeth. Now the, the problem, the contraindication here would be if you have anterior restorations, right? So the natural teeth are gonna lighten more than the restored sites. So it's um, important to think about that for your patients who have anterior restorations. We do have consent form examples um, so that you can notify patients pre-treatment so they can sign off and say they understand that their natural teeth may lighten more than their restored sites. Um, often people ask me if there are insurance codes and uh, yes, there are insurance codes, um, the maxillary and the mandibular arch. So I, are the codes covered? Not very often, not by PPOs. So um, use them, document them. That's what they're for. They're to document, document your services. When they are covered, um, usually it's a 50-50 plan. I've seen some Blue Cross Blue Shields that covered 80-20. Um, but typically it's 50-50 where the insurer pays 50% and the patient pays 50%. Um, but tray therapy also is a, uh, available uh, to be used for those uh, flexible spending and health saving dollars that people put forward and save up for. Um, this is the only tray that is cleared by FDA and it is cleared as a prescription medical device. So it can work for those as long as you have diagnosed gingivitis or periodontitis. It does need to be for disease elimination. 
Um, and I would say when you're talking to your patients, right, your goal is to get their gums healthy. That's what you want. So I would put the goals into that context, right? They're going to figure out that this is good for them for other reasons. But let's say your patient has gingivitis. You might say, our goal is to get your gums so healthy that you don't lose any bone and become a periodontal patient who has to come in every three months. I don't think most people know that they're going to lose bone or have to come in every three months. Or our goal is to get your gums so healthy if you're a maintenance patient that you won't have to repeat scaling every three years. That's an average, right? In stage two period. Or let's say they're stage three perio. Our goal is to get your gums so healthy that you won't have to have surgery down the line and we can keep your teeth for life. All of that has a financial implication. You don't really need to say that because you're, you're putting your goals into context. Right? I'm going to stop here because I just looked at the time and put up my contact information. If you are interested in learning more about this prescription tray therapy, please reach out to me. Um, if you're interested in coming to our annual meeting, uh, which is in October, look it up, perioprotect.com 2022. And Dr. Colt, I'm going to ask you to come back on and let's see if we have any questions. Um, someone asked if you can get copies of the slides. Yes, you can get copies of the slides. Yes, we'll even do your training for your team. We meet on Zoom and get it done. Um, but feel free, everybody, to open up your Q&A session. You just mouse over at the bottom of your screen and the Zoom bar will come up and there's a chat session, but there's also Q&A and we're looking in Q&A. Um, are trays made at the office or are they sent to the lab with patient impression? You can send a patient impression or a scan, but the trays, because they're cleared by FDA, they have to be made in a lab registered with FDA. So they're made... Um, Offsite, and there's um, four labs in the United States. And if you're from Canada, there's three labs in Canada. So, Dr. Colts, I was um, really encouraged um, by this, uh, looking and listening, because the the 4346 case that you showed is just such a clear, um, a, a clear challenge to people, right? So I, I was actually going to bring that up uh, after, and, and to be fair to everybody here, uh, per Perio Protect is a is a product that um, I've heard a lot about, but until Tanya and I started uh, speaking recently, I, I hadn't actually had a lot of clinical exposure to. So, you know, those particular cases I think were the ones that typically go untreated, you know, and they wait till they progress to periodontal disease. So it's great to have this adjunct that we can help uh, keep those from from progressing. Yeah, that's really what we want. We want to stop that disease early. So Dr. Colts, I'm not even clear on this. If somebody is interested in getting Overjet in private practice, is that available? Absolutely, yep. So we're available for pri private practice uh, or for enterprise clients. Um, you can shoot me an email. It uh, was typed in the chat. Uh, I'm happy to uh, do an actual demonstration of the Overjet product, uh, show you how it works in practices. But there's a lot of cool features I didn't go over because I didn't want to turn this into an infomercial, but uh, yeah, yeah a, lot, a, lot, a lot of good uh, stuff it'll do for practices. So you have a question here saying, what's next for AI? What do you envision next? What are you guys working on? What's submitted to FDA? Yeah, so we have a couple of FDA approvals in progress right now. Uh, our perifocal rate lucency uh, clearance is in progress. So hopefully that'll be uh, coming out here in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, along with that is our uh, primary dentition uh, FDA clearance. So right now we're FDA approved for uh, adult dentition. Uh, we'll have approval for pediatric dentition here shortly. That's exciting. Um, I have a, a chat in here. Overjet is a software that can integrate with my current practice software. Do you have any limitations on practice software? Uh, so we integrate with all of the major, uh, so Dentrix, EagleSoft, uh, Open Dental, um, Dentrix Ascend. We're uh, finalizing that integration. Uh, Denicon, um, there's probably one or two I'm, I'm missing. So we integrate with your patient management system and we integrate with your uh, x-ray program. Uh, X-rays are captured in real time, automatically uploaded to the cloud, and then annotated. And I'm super excited about being able to integrate what you're seeing with pictures and and your probing charts. What do you know? What's on the horizon there? Yeah. So currently in the product, uh, we actually already will look at probing depths and bone level measurements, and then make a recommendation based off aggregating that information. Uh, you can view within the product itself uh, which teeth have elevated probing depths. Um, I, I think we can make a stronger periodontal integration where we, because you, you can't actually pull up the periodontal chart, for example, within okay. Overjet. 
Um, but I think that would be an opportunity to make a stronger integration, um, especially you know if, if you're trying to make a standardized protocol for your hygiene teams that would include you know para protect and uh, irrigation and things like that. I think I think having the bleeding points and things like that would be very hard. Yes, eliminating the the you know the resistance points always helpful for the clinician. Um, and, and and actually, so one of my pet projects that that we're working on is can we retire the perio probe? No. Oh. Um, and so the the I thought is, and this is all experimental, so uh, you know there's a lot of research I would go in and to prove it's effective. But can we combine AI data from intraoral scans because there are a lot of offices that are scanning all the new patients? Right. Pair that pair that with information gleaned from the heart tissue data on a radiograph to infer within a plus or minus a millimeter accuracy, which is the requirement for hygiene school and dental school, um, you know, could we infer a periopocket depth from that? So that, that's like some experimental stuff we're working on. Uh, I, I certainly never enjoyed probing. Uh, I was yeah. glad I had hygienists who would do that. So <laughs> We thank you for your time tonight. We know it's valuable and it's been an hour and a half and it's been fun for us. So, and Dr. Colts, thanks for being with me tonight. Uh, no, always a pleasure.